Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome to another scintillating program, this time featuring none other than the Honorable Dr. Victoria Keener, Senior Research Fellow for the East West Center, and in her capacity today as the Chair of the Honolulu Climate Change Commission. We read more and more and more and more about the need for resilience. We've seen disasters in our Northwest, Canada, Siberia, our South, Central China, the list goes on and on and on. And I think a lot of us will agree the list is going to continue to go on and on and on. We unfortunately ain't seen nothing yet but there's a whole bunch of us working to ameliorate that situation. And front and center is Dr. Victoria Keener. Thanks so much, Doctor, for joining us today. So why don't you start by saying something about the mission of the Climate Change uh, Commission and uh, the way you, you operate? And then we'll get into uh, specifics later. Sure. Um... Well, maybe I'll skip to uh, slide four, which gives a little bit of information about um, what the Honolulu Climate Change Commission is and, um, and what we do and how long we've been around. Um, so um, actually I'll correct you on one thing first. I am the outgoing chair. Um, so I served uh, over the last year as chair and the last month actually transitioned over to Dr. Chip Fletcher, who will be the chair for this um, upcoming year. So. Um, Let me interject, Chip Fletcher, one of the leading, world's leading climatologists. You're very, very honored to, to have him on, on board with you. He is yeah. literally worldwide known. Yeah, he's, he's um, definitely our go-to for sea level rise, um, both in Hawaii and in the region, not just, you know, with the um, physical science, but also uh, social impacts um, of climate change and uh, sea level rise and looking at planning and policies as well. So he's great, uh, a great resource on the commission and for the state and the region. Um, but if we go back to uh, uh, slide four for a second about the commission. So um, the, the Climate Change Commission started in 2018 and it's actually voted on by city charter. Um, so we're, we're in the city charter and our charge is to gather the latest science and information on climate change impacts to Hawaii um, and to advise the uh, uh, Climate Change Sustainability and Resilience Office um, in the city, the mayor and the city council and the executive departments about um, the future climate scenarios as relevant to current and future planning and policy and the impacts that we could see across different sectors that are relevant to city planning. Um, so there are five members uh, that are on the mission. Mm -hmm. Hawaii State Energy Office and the Resilience Office work very, very, very closely. So we're deeply allied there. So you're you're in good hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, they're they're wonderful, and and you know they um, they're independent from the Climate Change Commission, um, but at the same time they serve as you know kind of our key office for liaising with the city. Um, so there are five members that are appointed for five year terms. And we have expertise in, um, in different things. Uh, if you can go forward one slide. Um, we have five members. Um, so this is the, the previous iteration where I was the chair. My background is in um, hydroclimatology and um, kind of applications, interdisciplinary applications of um, climate science into policy and management. My vice chair was Dr. Rosie Aligato. Uh, she works at... Um, UH and she uh, does a lot of um, uh, ecosystem work and works with uh, indigenous uh, Hawaiian communities. McKenna Kaufman, who is actually the previous chair for the last two years. Um, Dr. McKenna Kaufman is at e uh, University of Hawaii in the economics department. She's a specialist in greenhouse gas and energy policies. Uh, as I said, Dr. Chip Fletcher, the new chair, who's I'm a sea level rise specialist and uh, works very heavily in climate change education and conservation and community resilience. And um, finally, Bettina Menert, who's um, uh, 
a green des building design leader and uh, works in um, uh, construction and design um, in Hawaii. Uh, so we've also had quite a few outputs um, so far. Um, so the, the kind of guidance that we've released has included a briefing just about climate change impacts in the state, sea level rise guidance, um, shoreline setback guidance, kind of building on um, existing shoreline setback uh, regulations. Um, we put out a memo on a one water framework. So integrating all different types of fresh water across different departments into a single management framework. Um, we put out climate change and financial risk guidance for the city. Um, more recently, we've done a climate and social equity guidance document and um, one looking at the social costs of carbon. Um, and the one we're working on still that has yet to be released is a guidance paper on climate change in the construction industry. Hmm, impressive. So what are some of the specific programs that you uh, work with then? I'm looking in particular at encourage density and mixed use. Yeah, so I can give a little bit of, um, what, why don't I start with, um, kind of how I see the commission, what we've done over the last year and how I see us being useful for the city and state. Um, and then I can move into some of the products that have come out of the CCSR, including the climate action plan and the resilience strategy. And we can go into those from there. Absolutely. All right, so, so I'll start with kind of how I see the, um, the commission working. You know, we, we're, this, we're supposed to be a trusted and authoritative source of science-based climate information that's relevant to planning. And um, kind of in the, in the academic lingo, what you call a, um, a group that works across both uh, academic science and um, uh, so researchers, community members, decision makers, um, what you call that is a boundary organization. Um, and so uh, if we go to slide two, um, we actually see ourselves as a climate boundary organization in the Honolulu Climate Change uh, Commission. And what that does is provide an interface between those three groups. So academic science to community to policymakers. So whether, you know, in basic science, you would just stay mostly in that um, kind of publication and data role. This you really work across both um, the impacts and the community work and getting, um, getting the right knowledge to inform different policies. Um, so so that you're actually, Victoria, you're a boundary crossing organization. Right. On, yeah, that's kind of yeah. what the term um, term has come to mean, and it's kind of performative. So if you label yourself a boundary organization, you can act as one. So other famous climate boundary organizations, you know, global ones, you might know the IPCC, of course, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, so you know, they work with. Um, creating uh, scientific guidance, translating that into impacts in different sectors, and then creating guidance for, um, for policymakers as well. So that's on a global scale. And I really see the Honolulu Climate Change Commission as taking that down to the local level. So you know, instead of working on global projections of climate in different sectors, we're really looking at the local level. Um, and, and the two major um, roles that I think that the boundary organization in this case serves is being supportive of policymakers and um, planners and being critical of, um, uh, of different policy debates with a science-based, uh, provide providing science-based information to that. Um, so that's just kind of a, a little bit of background on how I see us. But um, one of the things that um, the CCSR put out um, in 2019 was the Ola Oahu Resilience Strategy. Um, so if we go ahead to whatever slide that is, seven, um, we can go over the four areas uh, that came out. And this was an extremely inclusive progress process that uh, interacted with thousands of people over the course of a year to inform this, both community members, um, planners, leaders, uh, academics, um, people all across different parts of, of society on the island. So they came out with four resilient strategies for the island. Um, and the four were long-term affordability for island residents, resilience in the face of natural disasters, climate change adaptation and mitigation, and leveraging the leadership of communities that we already have. Uh, so a lot of this was, um, 
within each of these four categories, I think about 44 actions that came out of this uh, were identified in terms of increasing the long-term resilience, short and long-term resilience of Oahu. Um, and so these strategies have, have been identified um, and really where we need to go next is how to implement them. The next thing uh, that came out, if you go to slide eight, very recently uh, was the One Climate, One Oahu Climate Action Plan. Um, and this is a five-year plan going from 2020 to 25 that starts to really identify, um, if you will, where the rubber meets the road and these, these <laughs> strategies that um, it's going to take to reduce greenhouse gases, meet our energy goals um, and our emissions reductions from both at the, uh, at the city and the state level. Um, and they identified nine uh, major actions that you can see here. Uh, on the right of this slide. So some of those are encouraging density and mixed land use, uh, land use strategically, enabling multiple modes of transportation, encouraging mode shift uh, through parking efficiency, electrifying the city fleet, uh, reducing energy demand by increasing efficiency, maximizing efficiency and renewables through city operations, expanding renewable energies, promoting waste prevention and maximizing waste resource efficiency. But really where we need to go next is how to make these happen. We've identified what needs to happen, but the, the specific actions, um, I think, is where it gets really tricky. Yes, yes. Yeah, the, uh, I'm with the Hawaii State Energy Office, and our goals are very, very similar to this because we're, we're deeply involved in uh, transportation efficiencies also. So I'm I'm hoping that uh, you know we if rather than stepping on one another's toes at all, we you know really 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 collaborate in in our uh, efforts. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's a kind of a natural next step, and um, exactly what the city wants to do, and what we need is to get you know good partners in on each of these strategies as well to make uh, to to kind of actualize them. So you know that they haven't laid out a roadmap of how to get these things done. What they've done is identify goal and some strategies and what um, the city and the state now need is, is partnerships and uh, both within government, um, academia, business, uh, working together to really figure out how to cross those silos. Because as you know, um, you know, it's not just Hawaii, it's really everywhere where um, silos, people get really locked into their own kind of sector and silo and they don't um, talk to different departments that could be really helpful in actualizing some of these things. And these are massive, <laughs> massive undertakings. We, we right. need all the help, all the expertise we, we can possibly uh, muster. Right. Yeah, so, so oh, go, go ahead. You, no, no, go, you go ahead. Uh, one uh, item that intrigues me is, because I don't think that the Energy Office has thought of this yet, is encourage mode shift through parking efficiency. Mm -hmm. What is that? Yeah, so one of the um, one of the things and this was I believe that it was I'm going to get all my bills wrong. now. I believe it was bill 20 that went through that really looked at how yeah. to um, optimize uh, parking and the parking regulations that would go through for um, either um, developing new buildings or um, uh, or, or working on old buildings and the different types of parking regulations that um, developers and builders are required to include. Um, so, so when it's when they're looking at parking efficiency, is there a better way to use the land that's now being designated um, for only parking, or is there a different? Um, are there different rules on on um, the different like uh, putting electric um, vehicle charging infrastructure? And you know what are the different types of efficiencies that could be improved upon? Um, and I I know that now I'm not I'm not up on this now, but um, there was something that just went through with some of the um, kind of an addition to to Bill 20, looking at some of those specific parking efficiency implementations in the city. Um, I can find that for you later, but um, they're really starting to think about actualizing some of that. So that's actually going forward faster than um, than maybe we had planned for, which is great. Sounds good. Yeah, we, uh, from the energy office standpoint, we worked very, very closely with the city uh, last year on Bill 25, 
rather than Bill 20. And that was specifically to adopt the 2018 or 15 International Energy Conservation Code. And the most controversial provision therein was to mandate EV ready access for both residences and uh, multifamily and commercial buildings. That's where when you're building a building, you plumb the lines so that you have a, a little plug available, say in the garage of your home. So when you're ready to put in your EV charger, all you have to do is unscrew this little plug and boom, there's your EV charger waiting for you. And that took a long time to pass and many, many compromises, but uh, we, we did it. At this, I'm, I'm kind of interested, if you wouldn't mind going into it, what were the biggest issues at the state level for, um, the, for, the, for, for doing that? Oh, you mean our, our prerogative or our, our, our incentive? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, number one, we're shooting for 100% clean electrical energy by the year 2045. And that is a combination, of course, of basically solar energy and wind energy coming, increasing, 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 while energy use decreases, decreases, decreases until the, the two lines uh, intersect. And electric vehicles are something in the order of at least five or six times as efficient as our gas burning vehicles. Mm -hmm. And our, the goal is to get all of that electricity from renewable sources. So right. voila, you've got 100% clean ground transportation there. That, that's our, our thinking. Right. Yeah, maybe um, I'll go back to one other product that the, uh, that the Climate Change Commission, the Honolulu Climate Change Commission put out, I believe last December, um, and that was our social equity guidance document. So really looking at how to um, achieve more equitable outcomes in climate adaptation. And I think it's kind of relevant to all of these discussions as we're looking forward, all of those, um, those whatever nine areas identified in the climate action plan going forward. Um, and if you could go to slide six. So this was, um, these guidance recommendations came out of, um, you know, months of work with um, different stakeholders and reviewing equity plans from cities, states, and countries um, at different scales and seeing what would really work. And what we came up with were, so we took a, a pledge um, as a commission to try and increase um, equity considerations and climate adaptation. Um, but the five recommendations were to really think about centering social equity in all adaptation and mitigation plans, identify our frontline communities, um, that are be go going to be experiencing both climate stressors and shocks um, to integrate equity into the resilient strategy. And of course, now the climate action plan um, and to find areas where that could be improved to collaborate with communities more, to share information and to focus on outreach to underserved communities, um, both in the past and right now through ex expanding options of participation. Um, and I think a lot of these are really relevant to the um, energy, uh, guidance policies and um, you know not not just that but parking and EVs and going forward as well to consider what types of communities might have been left out of these conversations when we're looking at um, you know what might first seem like a very straightforward um, a very straightforward um, positive goal for um, decreasing climate emissions you know so um, yeah maybe I'll leave that there and let you you respond yeah, that's, uh... I, I go back to the lively discussions we had during uh, for along Bill uh, 25, mm -hmm. and that was the original proposal was to put EV ready stations in all multi-story residential structures, mm -hmm. and then people came forward and says we need low cost housing or affordable housing, and mm -hmm. all you're doing here is increasing the cost of housing, and I don't know if you've been in these specific debates, but our estimate was that it would increase the cost of an individual living unit by about $800. And their estimate was all the way up to $10,000 with intermediate estimates in, in between. 
I don't know if you've been through that sort of a debate, but mm -hmm. so finally we had to, this is ironic, decrease the number of EV ready uh, mm -hmm. installations in affordable housing. So we're doing, we're doing an unequitable uh, choice in, in this case. So th this is the type of, this is all new territory. And this is the type of conundrum that we uh, are coming up against all the time. Yeah, and I think it's it's clear that these are very complicated questions, right? But but keeping that um, that equity focus at the forefront will, um, you know, when we're conceptualizing these problems, I think can make the conversation go forward faster. So not e not only thinking about um, you know affordability, but also thinking about um, access. So who has access to these resources um, in the first place? And you know, when you look at um, for example, like the renewable energy uh, project siting, so solar farms or wind farms. We've seen a lot of controversy about that on Oahu as well. Um, so some of the strategies that, that I think we need to embrace going forward are not just working with um, kind of the regular group of high level stakeholders representing you know, industry and, and academia and, and um, businesses, but also bringing communities in from the start to really talk about what it is they want for their community, whether that's more EV spaces, whether that's um, uh, uh, a more equitable use of land or siting of um, renewable energy projects, but just making that line of communication more open. Yeah, yeah. There are people in our office who are very heavily engaged in, in exactly those types of the issues. Somehow the community of Kahuku comes to mind, especially yep. <laughs> we were. Yeah, and one of our, um, excuse my cat meowing in the background, uh, one, of our, um, uh, uh, one of our climate pledge, um, uh, things that we pledged to for equity in the commission was to hold our meetings in different places mm -hmm. regularly. So um, people at you know, different times of day, different communities in different places around the island, not just at Honolulu Hale. Um, mm -hmm. in the middle of the day where different communities can't regularly show up and we see the same faces um, showing up again and again to our meetings. Um, unfortunately, we haven't been able to hold in-person meetings um, because of the pandemic for the last um, year and change, but um, you know, we are committed to uh, when we are able to hold in-person meetings again, starting to move around the island and working harder to engage in person with, with different communities. Yeah, the, the city in general has been very, very, very good about that. Before the Bill 25 uh, debates opened up in City Hall or in the council rooms, I think the city went out all over the island and had, mm -hmm. I don't know, at least a dozen different meetings in a dozen different locations. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's following in, in some really equitable uh, footsteps there. Yeah, and it takes up so much time, you know, but I think that that's um, looking forward on some of these, you know, really difficult implementation questions that we have looking at the climate action plan. Oh, and I didn't even mention that the city is now doing their climate adaptation plan, um, mm -hmm. not to be con confused with the climate action plan. So action is more about mitigation of greenhouse gases, those key strategies that we're looking at um, to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, at, the, at the city level across different departments and sectors. But the adaptation plan is saying, okay, well, some of these climate impacts are already baked in. Um, we are going to be experiencing them um, to, to larger extents for the most part um, as we go forward. So what do we need to do and how should we prioritize getting these adaptation projects done? Um, and so that's being, uh, that's being done by CCSR right now and they're starting to hold meetings or they've held a series of meetings already around the island, all virtual, um, but they're continuing to engage with people. And really, I think a lot of the question is how do you prioritize risk in these environments? So, um, you know, some of that is going to be uh, making sure you're not just listening to the loudest voice who shows up to all those meetings. Again, that's a question of, you know, equity. How do we balance um, exposure in different places versus uh, uh, access to resources um, versus historical impacts, frankly. Yeah, we uh, at our level, we've just had a big debate about passing another building code, which has to do with resilience. And the proponent, a civil engineer, 
said, we've got to beef up new buildings to X strength to withstand a mega tsunami. And then other engineers came in and said, that's a very nice idea, but it'll increase costs. So what, what do you, uh, what do you do there? Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, I it's, run it's, into this over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah. and it's again weighing those financial and um, you know risks versus the impacts, right? Which we saw in Florida with the condo collapse very recently. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, that was a risk that um, they they had built into their um, their plans to to a greater or lesser degree and mm-hmm. had chosen not to act yet. Um, and I think that that should be a real consideration for Oahu and the state going forward as well. Yeah, because we have, like Southern Florida, we have a high salt environment and that can corrode the heck out of the rebars mm-hmm. that hold concrete structures together. That seems to have been the uh, uh, the culprit in South Florida. And I right. remember somebody in a high rise here in Honolulu was leaning on a railing and suddenly the railing gave and down he went. And the culprit again was a corroded uh, rebar in the country. Yeah. I think there are probably very few people who uh, live in Hawaii who didn't w- read that news item with a little bit of alarm. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe it's good to start the conversation. Yeah. Um, but I, I see we're coming up on, um, on time. So it, would you mind if I talked about some kind of priorities for the next year that we've already identified in the commission? We've got about two minutes, but actually we can move a little bit over. So please, please go ahead. Okay, let's go to slide nine. Um, And these are priorities uh, for the next year that we already talked about with um, the director uh, of the CCSR office, uh, Matt Gonser, um, as well as as, uh, stakeholders and the commissioners um, representing people across uh, different departments in the city. So there is a big um, emphasis on extreme heat, actually, how we prepare for extreme heat. Um, and ways to shore up our existing infrastructure and who's going to be impacted by that. Um, It's actually one of the most sure impacts of climate change that we can plan for. We know that, um, you know, rainfall might be a little more uncertain, but we know it's getting hotter. um, And so we have to plan for that. Um, And we already see kind of the urban heat island effect. CCSR did a really great study last year looking at the different um, uh, uh, temperatures all over the city and the island. Um, seeing some big differences between areas with trees and green space versus just pavement. Um, also integrated stormwater management. So working across different departments to work on um, uh, ways to, to manage um, stormwater across different departments who might be dealing with that. Um, implementation of the climate action plan, like I already mentioned. So we have these nine priorities, but how do we actually implement them? How do we provide guidance to actually implement them and meet those goals. Um, There's also interest in looking at economic consequences of different climate change impacts, because if we're honest, um, you know, we can give lots of data and lots of projections, but they go a lot, uh, they're a harder pill to swallow when they have a dollar sign attached to them, both in how much they'll cost and how much they'll cost to fix. Um, And then finally, the adaptation strategy um, from CCSR. So doing community engagement with the city on um, meeting their adaptation strategies and helping them prioritize their needs. Yes. Wow. Nothing ambitious about that. Nothing yeah. whatsoever. <laughs> so I give you hearty, hearty uh, congratulations, uh, Victoria. And we we have come to a close. Thank you so much. It's been a great honor getting to know you and learning all about the commission's work. So Thanks, until Howard. next time, this is Howard Wig, Code Green, Sync. Tech Hawaii, Mahalo Nui Noa, and see you next time.